Welcome back to Out of the Fog. Uh, real quick, just turn the camera to this guy. Uh, the hair, the mustache, you're so charming. I love talking to you, Mr. John Harris. How are you, man? Thanks for having me on, Jason. I'm doing good. Yeah, so um, executive uh, d director of external affairs, yeah. correct? With Memorial University of Newfoundland Student Union, Monsu, but you're, you're almost done. I'm almost finished my term. I will be passing the torch to the next uh, executive and uh, I hope they continue to fight for uh, lower tuition and better lives for students, more affordability. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to move on and finally hopefully finish my degree and yeah. Can immediate, I had a whole bunch of stuff that I want to talk about, but then you said that and it made me think, how? Like, you want them to fight for lower tuition and better lives. I don't, I, I think that if you look across Canada, uh, the new tuition rate is, uh, is, is comparable to other provinces, you know, with the exception of Quebec. Uh, I think that Quebec has really shown that they value their education and they value the young people. And, uh, you know, young people in Quebec are, are set up a lot better for their future than they are now in this province. Uh, I think that now in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have uh, a special need to grow our economy, to grow our industries, to, to keep uh, young people staying here and not moving to the mainland. I think that giving, giving an uh, opportunity to go to education and, and do it cheaply uh, and affordably is what keeps people in this province and is what brings people from other provinces here. I think that by having you know a similar price education in uh, larger sectors or larger uh, uh, economies like Ontario, it just gives people more of a reason to move to Ontario. Because you got to pay the same amount anyway. Why would I stay here? If there's more jobs in Ontario, if there's more opportunities, that's where people are going to go. I think we have, you know, we we have to be smart about how we use Memorial as the engine of our economy. I think that if we uh, invest in in our economy uh, by investing in post-secondary education, like many countries uh, in Europe, they have, you know, very cheap, very affordable. Uh, post-secondary education, we can use that to prime our industry with, with high-paid, uh, high-skilled workers uh, that increases the tax base, that has people staying here with good jobs, uh, and it grows the, you know, the, the reputation of, of Memorial when there's sure. more funding, it grows the, the province's reputation, and it brings people in. Uh, you know, Memorial actually brings in hundreds of millions of dollars of federal research money. It, it uh, brings in professors from all over the world, bringing their expertise in their research that, that help uh, you know, indigenous communities with uh, ice, uh, say for the example of Smart Ice, you know, it created a huge tech industry yeah. with Verifin. These are all Memorial University initiatives and would not have been possible without uh, the funding that goes to Memorial. I think, I mean, it, I mean all of Eastern Health, like, it, it, like, there's, these are all like, a lot of, most of doctors' offices and hospitals around, they're all teaching centers also like it's all it's a part it's all very integrated these are good points yeah yeah so it's it's it is the lifeblood of of our economy here and you know reports uh, have shown it's it, how beneficial it is and i think that there's some short sightedness when we want to take that approach which we have you know been doing for a long time it's a public university and we're trying to bring a kind of private logic into it which doesn't really work for the kind of institution that it is it's so integrated with our economy we need uh, the university to uh, train nurses, to train teachers, to train uh, all of these, uh, you know, important sectors uh, of our, you know, both of both our private and our public industries. And without those teachers, when we're seeing, you know, without those students being enrolled, we're already seeing a 20% drop in climate uh, of enrollment. Sorry, uh, after the tuition hike, we're we're not we're having trouble filling those seats. We're, we're missing. We're down social workers. We're bringing in expensive travel nurses because people don't want to go into nursing. So if there's, so, but if people, a lot of what you're saying, obviously there's a bunch of good points there and, and clearly you're informed on the topic, but it can be really easy to um, cross-contaminate bits of data. So 
it seems to me that it could be possible that enrollment is down because um, people don't have as many kids and they haven't been having as many kids for 17 or 18 years. And people don't want to uh, go to nursing school because they just saw this massive campaign about how underpaid uh, and overworked nurses are. Or uh, we're hiring travel nurses because you can put it in a different column in the budget spreadsheet and like it and you don't have to have that argument with your local um, with your I get I guess your local union or like there's a whole bunch of reasons for that stuff uh, it's you know in order for the economy of this province to run it, it needs to spend a lot of money on having an educated population and that's been clear since the the get-go you know with the when you know we're talking about Joey Smallwood off camera yeah. with the with that was his first that was the first bill uh, ever passed in the House of Assembly was the Memorial Act to create this university uh, who you know only the rich in Newfoundland who could send their children off to Halifax or to Ontario to get university uh, could could afford it, and 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 that that's something that that Joy wanted to change. And for four years, uh, it was uh, absolutely free, and actually you'd get a stipend from 1965 to 1969 to go to uh, get an education. And I, I think that although the you know conditions have changed and you know, the the economy has changed, I think that logic still rings true. In, in a moral sense, we have a, a duty to give the opportunity to all those who wish to to be able to seek a university education regardless of their ability to pay. So, so I, but what do you do about the fact that as much as we, there, there are arguments to be made that are legitimate arguments that the, the system that we live in in our economy that is mostly capitalistic and that we barter goods and services and we trade funds in exchange for things like that's, that there is a reality that that is the way that we've set up our society and we live in it. How do you avoid the fact that that the money has to come from somewhere to fund the machine if it's not coming from the people who are paying tuition? Like, that seems like the, for me at least, the first obstacle. Because I agree, it would be amazing if we could all be higher educated for the betterment of ourselves, our families, and our future and generations. I don't think anybody could reasonably say that's a bad idea. It's better. It's just inherently better but the first hiccup is well somebody got paid for that yeah where did it come from I think that that's you no know, that's a good question I think that when you look at a budget their value documents we we want our, our our kids to be educated so we pay for k-12 education that's a huge cost but because we know how important it is we put it in the budget and we pay for it uh, I think that the same logic applies to healthcare. We want a population that has, uh, you know, a good health regardless of their ability to pay for it. So we put that in budget. We pay for it. I think it's the same kind of logic. Uh, you know, in the same year that the Fury government cut 68.4 million dollars to the Memorial Operating Grant to be phased out over five years, there was a 323 million dollar surplus. So and and you know, while I I, I agree that. You know, people needed money. The, the the Fury government decided to give $500 checks to everybody, and uh, for a lot of people who needed it, that was great. For a lot of people who maybe didn't really need it at the time, it was more of a, a, a tax cut. So it was, you know, there's there's always these decisions when it comes to to uh, to budgets. And if you know, if you value education, having an educated populace, you put that money into uh, in, into post-secondary education. But, I mean, it's, it's, a long, it's a long problem to solve. Not so much that it's a long problem, but the solution to see the benefit of what you put in place, it, like it's a longitudinal study <laughs> to watch it happen. And it seems like in a lot of ways, like our current financial situation, we were talking there's a budget coming out real, real soon. Whatever is in that budget could be an incredibly good idea for the province in the long term, could be an incredibly bad idea for the province in the long term, but it could be 15 years before we really know. Is that a flaw that's built into the sort of Commonwealth-style political system that we have? 
like you're obviously politically minded and you're good at this. Like if you if you were premier, you got you got to get everybody to say well over half the people to say yes twice, and then you got eight years to make your mark forever, and you might be wanting to solve a problem that can't be solved in eight years. It's sort of unfair, is it not? It's, it's, it's tough because, yeah, the, the ramifications of decisions made by past premiers last for a long time. Like back to Joey Smallwood, yeah. the Churchill Falls deal, that we're still facing the, the economic problems that have come out of that, that deal. And the, the 40 year plus uh, signing on of a very low rate of yeah. selling energy to Quebec. And, you know, the, those kind of short sighted uh, decisions that last a long time, have long time ramifications, are, are, are a real scenario for a lot of premiers. And I think that if, if, you know, if the Fury government continues on the path they're going with Memorial, in, in 20 years we'll wonder why all of the programs have been uh, you know, cut in half, why enrollment is down, why we have less people coming to this province, why we'll have less educated uh, populace, why we'll have less opportunities and less uh, industry and less jobs here. And we'll look back at the cuts to Memorial and we'll say, well, that's that legacy. I think that it's, it's a, a simple kind of uh, a fix. I think that the, the $68.4 million is putting Memorial uh, you know, uh, in a position where it's, where it's difficult to, to continue the way it's going. There's, you know, there's hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, deferred uh, maintenance. You know, the infrastructure is crumbling. We're, you know, we're welcoming people into Canada Games in uh, 2025, and uh, you know, we're scrambling at the last minute to, to make all of these beautification projects happen. But that's not really necessary if you have a, a, a properly funded university that, that isn't uh, passing off the deficit onto our young people. Because you know, the deficit doesn't disappear when you cut memorial. No, yeah. You're just passing it on to young people who are going to be entering the workforce. If they can get a loan, they'll be entering with $30,000 in debt. to pay Paul. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, you're just transferring the debt to, to our young people, and that's not how you grow an uh, you know, economy. Well, John, thank you. And also, uh, he's, he's, he's not running again. So, but I don't know why, Mr. Harris, but whatever, dude. Thank you for coming out. Uh, and I just, I have a funny feeling that it won't be the last that you will hear of Mr. John Harris. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. I'm going to get real quick to this because um, there's somebody young and charming and handsome uh, that is younger, more charming, and more handsome than me that was born recently. And I'd like to talk about Newfoundland ponies. Awesome, and I would too. Yep. Um, register with the Newfoundland uh, Pony Society. Yep, Kelly so, Power Kane. Yes, Kelly, sorry. Um, it's a society, and I think that that's important because while everybody has heard of Newfoundland ponies, I don't know if, in general, the audience understands um, the heritage, the severe degree of endangerment of them as a species, and how they need a society to sort of help protect and foster, and so there's a whole lot of stuff that we can talk about here. Uh, where do you want to start? Let's talk about ponies. Okay, so the Newfoundland pony uh, is a, a land race that evolved over centuries. The Newfoundland ponies evolved from equine that came from uh, Europe 
Um, they intermingled on the island amongst themselves and evolved into a breed that could live in, on our island in our harsh conditions, the weather, little food. I mean, there's a saying that a Newfoundland pony can survive off of rocks. Now, we know that's not true, <laughs> but uh, they're very, very durable in our climate. And they built Newfoundland as we know it. They hauled the wood to build the houses. They cleared the land. They hauled fish from the flakes. They made us where we are today, and you're correct, the, over the um, recent years, rehoming laws and bylaws have limited the roaming of Newfoundland ponies, so people had to downsize, and at one point in time, there was less than 100 Newfoundland ponies left in the world, um, and it was recognized, and the society, society was formed to protect and preserve the Newfoundland pony. We owe it to them. They helped us build Newfoundland as we know it, so let's help them and make sure that they remain. So it's, it's sort of interesting that they, as a breed, built themselves, right? Just like, like evolution does. They just selected for whatever genes over different generations and centuries of being here that created this breed that was of a size, shape, and strength, and a caliber that was able to not only exist here, but to exist here and be I'll just, this is lame, I'll just say, and be a real war, workhorse, like literally. And so, <laughs> and, but then they not only built themselves, they built where we live with like, you know, they've done the hard labor and, uh, and built themselves a heritage. And now it's almost like it's time that we pay back a little bit of that to protect them. Absolutely, yeah. They did evolve, you're correct. Their body, they have low set tails, so the snow and rain will fall off of them. Their coats keep them warm. They have short furry ears, same reason. And not only their physical stature, hard uh, hooves that do well in our rocky terrain, but their personalities have evolved into the friendliest, smartest animals that you can imagine. It's, I, it, I never would have thought about that part. Yeah, they are. They're they're so smart. I know our pony when first went to the barn that Metcalf's farm in Manuals. Um, Mr. Metcalf thought he was leaving the lights on every night when he went uh, shut off the you know closed the barn up for the evening. And what it was was our pony Belle turning the lights back on. <laughs> the lights came on. She got fed. She wants food. Let's turn the turn lights, lights on. on. Let's get fed. Yeah. That's horses are like the the whole equine like genealogy. Is that anyway? That whole section of mammals has a higher than average intelligence, intelligence across, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Belle is a locksmith. She can triple. Op she can open the triple locks on the stall next to get the crumbs that the other pony. <laughs> so they are very. They're they're exceptional. You gotta hide it's, cameras just to see who does stuff. Yeah. There's only her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about um, Shaggy. Yes, so we're so excited. Shaggy is pony number one, to the best of our knowledge, born in 2024. February 26 to Danielle and Chris Hobbs of Bunyan's Cove, who are um, new kids on the block breeders, and we're really excited to have them. They're expecting three more foals this year, so that's going to be four that we know of in Newfoundland, and there will be others. Uh, we, it's exciting because we find as the breeding season starts where the ponies are coming from across uh, Newfoundland, across Canada, and we do have a population in the U.S. that also breed. So it's an exciting time uh, for sure. Last year we had a bumper crop. We had 40 foals, which is awesome. Bumper uh, crop. That's an expression <laughs> I've not heard before. Can you, like, that just means a lot? A lot, yeah. The year, previous years, uh, to my knowledge as registrar, I think I've been registrar for six or eight years. It's kind of all blurred together. But uh, Especially those few years there, a couple of years ago, they just sort of like, it was like that one month of February that was like yeah, 18 forever. months long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've had 20-ish, 26. So last year, 40 was exciting for us wow yeah or 40 plus 40 plus yeah. so current current best estimate of global count so it's really hard because ponies die we don't find out yeah I like to say less than 600 worldwide 
maybe less. Um, and in Newfoundland, certainly the rest of the uh, the world, I can say, has more than Newfoundland has. So. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to guess, maybe 200-ish so in Newfoundland. There's something both sad and also romantic about Newfoundland not having the majority of Newfoundland ponies. So there is something a little bit sad too because it's so nostalgic and like, but they're Newfoundland ponies and they're right, but there's also a Newfoundland dog and there's also a Labrador and it just because they, it was bred or fostered here. Doesn't mean that it shouldn't be released onto the world for the good that it is. So there is really something kind of romantic about a breed that has built who we are as people being on the verge of complete decimation, like forever, to mm -hmm. be down to 100 or less than 100 individuals. And then for that to increase by you know, five or six hundred per, or five or six times over the course of, you know, the following generations. And for a lot of that to not be on our island, mm -hmm. that's sort of special, because like everybody else gets to see what perhaps we took for granted that led to this problem. Correct, and New the Newfoundland Pony is our, Newfoundland's only heritage animal. Um, in 1997 was declared Newfoundland's heritage animal. Uh, there is a Newfoundland dog, Labrador yep. Retriever. Um, they're represented well on the waterfront. We want a <laughs> Newfoundland Pony bronze statue. Yep. Um, so Newfoundland Pony Society to promote and protect. Exciting, we have a pony park that over the last couple of years has um, been established in Hope Hall near Dildo, yep. so lots of stuff going on there. Yeah, there's a fair amount of traffic. Oh, good traffic. And last year was the first year we officially opened with a mom and baby. And they were there for the people to see and interact with her and the foal. So that's, and we have plans to build more into an interpretation or, you know, offer the public more um, viewing of the Newfoundland pony. So we I mean, can say go there. a little bit of education so people could understand like why this is special. Because I suppose if you're not into the equine and you don't know much about it, uh, I mean, they all look like horses to me. Like they're all, there's some that are bigger than others and smaller than others. But I imagine, um, much like wine, the more you learn about it and the more you come to realize the differences between things, you start to see that they're much more far apart as individual subbreeds, mm -hmm. say, than people might might expect. But now, given that it's so so as a breed, the Newfoundland pony right now is rated where as far as like um, um, its endangerment as. Well, they, there's different criteria, and it's yeah. still under the critically endangered. Okay. Yeah, so that's yeah. what it's categorized as now. We've seen great strides, and, and as we spoke of, the increased breeding. And um, similar to Newfoundland, years ago, the death rate greater than the birth rate. Yeah. Sometimes I'm not exactly accurate. Yeah. Same with the Newfoundland pony, but certainly we're hoping to change that around. So with 40 plus foals last year, probably it was greater than the death rate. Sometimes we're not advised when ponies pass. Sure. Um, but um, yeah, we're hoping that we're going to turn the tables on that. that. Is, that's a testament to some of the stuff the society is doing, I imagine. The society and the dedicated owners of Newfoundland Pony. We, we usually say each mare should have two foals, one to replace their footprint and one to and one build to the population. And we have wonderful um, people across Canada and the U.S. that are contributing to that. So if people have a Newfoundland Pony now, the purpose of having that pony on the, for the average person. Is it, is it um, a pet? Is it a work animal? Is it for the perseverance of a historic breed? Like the average person who currently has a new flam pony. I, I think that's a little bit, you know, we we need to, to find a new purpose for the pony. Yes. So their purpose I suppose here, that's what I'm getting at. What no, do we do exactly. with these guys now? So, yes, a pet. Yes, to pre preserve the heritage, of course, uh, what they deserve. Um, therapy. They have been, because of their personality, their size, um, they've been shown to be excellent for, as therapy horses. So for anybody who's um, interested in learning more 
or perhaps they want to donate to the cause because it is valuable. Um, we'll make sure that we get some information to them on the old Google machine to Excellent. go to Newfoundland Pony Society and, uh, and we'll see what we can do to help out here. Thank you. We are a charitable foundation so uh, we welcome all support in manpower, fi uh, financial, any way that you wish to help buy a pony, reach out. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll brush me a pony for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. All right. Thank and you. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back after this. Your opinion matters, and we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us using our viewer feedback line, your direct connection to shaping the shows you love. It's easy. Just grab your phone, scan the QR code on your screen, and take our quick survey. Share your thoughts, and let's make your viewing experience even better. Welcome back. Um, sometimes when I sit on this pretty teal, blue, green, orange, I don't know, whatever color it is, I wonder to myself, how am I gonna tie these conversations together? Well, it just happens. History, culture, heritage, and legacy. That's what we were talking about with Newfoundland Ponies, and that's what we're talking about with John Harris. What is the government's legacy going to be? Is it going to be a stain? on Memorial University, or is there more to this story that will be revealed when our budget comes out in another few days? Like, it's, it's just, it's so fascinating the degree to which things are interconnected. A uh, big thank you to everybody for coming out today. Look up new flam ponies, they're so cool. Thank you, John. Have a great night, and we'll see you next week. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. We want to hear from you. Provide feedback on this show or find out how you can get involved. Call, email us, or scan the QR code to take our quick survey. Buckle up, we're cleared for takeoff. Here we go, boys, here we go. 16 teams, one champion for the greatest trophy in sports.